In this video, we're going to look at how to calculate pre-stress losses in pre-stress concrete members. By the end of this module, I want you to be able to list and describe the mechanisms that cause pre-stressing to decrease over time, draw approximate strand stress and concrete stress versus time plots, and label the major points, explain how changes in strand stress affect concrete stresses and highlight design implications, use the PCI uh, design handbook method and the AASHTO LRFD 2017 approaches to estimate pre-stress losses, and finally explain two methods for measuring pre-stress losses. Our strand stress is going to decrease over time due to elastic shortening, creep, shrinkage, and strain relaxation. Pre-stress loss is a way to account for the decrease in strand stress when we're using the force and the tendon approach for calculating our stresses. Typically, we'll need to calculate our force and the tendon at, at least two different times. Once at release, so immediately after transfer, and once in service, or our final uh, pre-stress. So our initial pre-stress force, or our initial pre-stress stress is just going to be the stress in the bed minus our elastic shortening loss, which uh, we can take times the area of our strands to then give us our pre-stress force um, at transfer. Our final pre-stress force is the pre-stressing stress in the bed minus our total losses. And we take that times the area to give us our final pre-stressing force, which we can use when calculating our service levels or, or stresses due to service loads. There are many different ways we can estimate pre-stress losses. The two primary ones that we'll use are the PCI design handbook method and the uh, AASHTO LRFD uh, detailed or refined method. On the next few slides, we're going to look at how the strand stress changes over the life of a girder, um, depending on some significant uh, events that occur. The first steps during the girder fabrication process are shown on this slide. Uh, first, strands are run uh, down the length of a pre-stressing bed, and then the strands are stressed individually. Uh, or they can be gang stressed as well, but um, typically uh, strands are individually stressed just because of a decrease, or um, it, it's less expensive um, for the, the equipment. Um, so here you can see strands start at zero stress, and during jacking, they're jacked up to uh, a certain stress here. Uh, there are some initial anchorage seating losses that happen as the stress is transferred from the jacking equipment to the anchoring device. Um, again, this is in the pre-stressing bed. Uh, and then there are some additional relaxation and temperature losses that occur. The strand stress at this point here after our anchorage seat and seating losses and um, relaxation and temperature losses is typically called um, F sub PI or F sub PBT, um, the pre-stressing stress before transfer. After the strands are stressed, uh, the non-pre-stress reinforcement is then placed, um, so the rebar cage is, is tied. Uh, the side forms and uh, all the other formwork is installed, and the concrete's then placed. So uh, here's then a, a picture of a, the beam um, after curing and after the side forms have been removed. The stress needs to then be transferred from the um, bed, the pre-stressing bed, to the beams. Um, so this, the process for doing this will depend or will vary plant to plant. Um, the plant shown here has the ability to let some stress out of all the strands. Um, these are all hydraulic jacks. Uh, that start extended and then they um, decrease the extension, which lets some stress out of all the strands. Um, and, and then all the strands can be individually torch cut. Um, so some plants don't have this end equipment, so they need to just um, torch cut the strands. And uh, I guess a, a, this done properly, they'll heat the strands to kind of relieve some of the stress before uh, cutting uh, the strands in, in one location. So when the strands are cut, we're going to get these initial uh, or initial elastic shortening loss. Um, so you can see the beam immediately before the strands are cut. And then when the strands are cut, 
the beam will experience an upward deflection. So a shortening at the bottom that's greater than the shortening at the top, which will cause an upward deflection. And this is due to the eccentricity of our, our strands here. Um, so at this point, the stress in, in our strand is going to be our initial stress in the strand minus the elastic shortening losses. The beam is then typically stored at the precast plant uh, for a certain time period. Um, so during this time, the beam is going to continue to experience losses. Um, these are long-term losses, though. So we'll have uh, shr a shrinkage losses, creep, and strand relaxation pre-stress losses that will occur um, during this time between when the strands are transferred and when the deck is placed. So the beam is then taken uh, to the field and then a, a deck is placed on top. Um, so here's a, some pictures of the deck casting of this, uh, this bridge that these beams were for. The casting of the deck is going to increase the stress in the bottom fiber uh, of our beam, and it's also going to increase the stress in our pre-stressing. So you can see a little stress gain in the pre-stressing that's due to this deck placement. Um, so again, I want to just highlight that this stress gain um, is an increase in stress in both the bottom fiber uh, of our concrete and also the uh, pre-stressing strand. Typically, pre-stress losses are divided into short-term losses and long-term losses. Short-term losses are made up of elastic shortening losses and occur instantaneously at the time of transfer. Long-term losses occur, or time-dependent losses occur over time, and are a result of our creep, shrinkage, and strand relaxation. All of the significant times in a girder's life, or most of them, are, are highlighted on this slide with the corresponding change in strand stress. Uh, so you can see the first significant time is the time of transfer, and this is when our elastic shortening loss happens. Uh, next is the time of our, our deck and superimposed dead loads. Um, so the, these, both these loads will cause an increase in stress or a stress gain, an increase in our strand stress um, due to these loads. And it's a, those will be sustained loads, so they, they'll change our creep response. Uh, the final one here is our uh, live load or our time when our live load is applied. Um, so you can see that the live load is going to give an instantaneous response, and then it'll come back down uh, after the live load is taken off. Change in the strand stress is also going to result in a change in the bottom fiber stress of the beam. And this is why pre-stress losses are important for us in the design process. So if we have a beam and we apply an external load, it's going to impact the stress in the strand and the, uh, the stress in the bottom fiber. Um, so here at transfer, when we transfer the strand stress from the bed into the beam, it's going to increase the compression stress in the bottom fiber. Uh, over time, due to uh, or due to creep, shrinkage, and strand relaxation, this pre-compression is going to decrease. When we add in the deck, we get some tension, um, and our pre-compression is going to continue to decrease due to creep, shrinkage, and relaxation. You can see here we have the time of superimposed dead load. So uh, that's going to increase the tension in our bottom fiber. And then finally, we have our live load application. So the goal of our design is that this stress here in the bottom fiber when we apply the load is less than our tensile limit to, uh, to prevent cracking in the beams. Shown on this slide are the major four components of our pre-stress losses. Uh, our elastic shortening and creep are typically going to make up the majority of our pre-stress losses, followed by our shrinkage um, of the concrete that's going to uh, contribute to pre-stress losses. And then finally, this uh, the strand relaxation, which will make up the smallest component of our pre-stress losses. On the next few slides, we're going to briefly discuss the basic mechanisms uh, of pre-stress losses. Um, the first type of loss is elastic shortening loss. And elastic shortening loss is a result uh, of the fact that concrete members subjected to an external force are going to shorten instantaneously. So the amount of shortening is going to depend, be dependent on the magnitude of the force applied and the stiffness of the concrete. 
we can calculate our elastic shortening loss by first finding the strain in our concrete that's caused by this uh, by our pre-stressing force and uh, the self weight of the member. So to do that, we need to find the stress at the centroid of our pre-stressing strands, this F sub CGP, and divide by the stiffness of our concrete, uh, ECI. Uh, we can then take this strain in our concrete times the modulus of our pre-stressing to uh, convert it into a, a stress in our strands. Um, so this stress then is the stress change due to the shortening, um, yeah, due, due to the elastic shortening. And this expression is the same one that's found in, in uh, Ashto. The process for finding our elastic shortening, it can be an iterative process because the stress causing our elastic shortening is going to change relative to the amount of elastic shortening that occurs. So essentially when we first calculate the stress that's caused by our uh, pre-stressing at this, the stress in our concrete caused by the pre-stressing and the self-weight at the center of our pre-stressing strands, we need to assume uh, a certain stress in our pre-stressing. This stress in the pre-stressing is going to decrease as elastic shortening occurs. So that initial stress is going to change due to our elastic shortening. So what we can do is we can make an initial guess, calculate our strand stress with that initial guess, um, and see how this strand stress compares to the initial guess. If this strand stress that we find um, with our elastic shortening is not equal to the strand stress that we guess, then we need to iterate. So the next uh, iteration here, I'm taking the strand stress that we calculated, plugging it in here to the FCGP equation, and then uh, coming and solving for the strand stress again. Um, so we can keep iterating until the strand stress in our previous guess is equal to the strand stress that we um, calculate uh, with the actual elast elastic shortening. We can then take our, our, or use that last FCGP um, and take that times EP over ECI to find our uh, elastic shortening losses. Ashto also provides a closed form solution for solving for the elastic shortening loss. Um, so essentially you can plug in all your known values from your section and your self weight and your pre-stressing and calculate your elastic shortening loss directly. Uh, this equation is obtained by defining our stress at the centroid of our pre-stressing strands due to our pre-stressing and self-weight um, equal to this value shown here, where our strand stress is our strand stress before transfer minus our elastic shortening loss. We can then plug this equation into uh, the equation shown here for our elastic shortening loss. And you can see we'll have uh, elastic shortening loss on the left and elastic shortening loss on the right. And if we solve for the elastic shortening loss and simplify, we'll get this closed form solution. The two main time effects that are dependent on the concrete are creep and shrinkage. Creep is the deformation of concrete under, under a sustained load. In pre-stressed concrete, our sustained load is our pre-stressing force and also our self-weight, and then also any superimposed dead load applied later. Shrinkage is the volume change of concrete under no external load. Uh, shrinkage is primarily uh, driven by moisture movement. There are a couple different ways we can um, break down our creep. The first is uh, based on whether water is allowed to migrate to the environment. Basic creep is the long-term shortening of our concrete member under the effect of external stresses um, with a constant moisture content. So essentially it's in, in a closed system. When we apply a stress, we're going to get a, a stress or a change in strain over time. With our drying creep, uh, we're allowing moisture to migrate to the environment. So it's essentially it's an open system. And uh, you can see our drying creep, uh, if we allow for moisture movement, we're going to get increased creep um, compared to uh, basic creep. We can also categorize creep in terms of long-term creep and short-term creep. Uh, short-term creep is mainly recoverable and it mainly results from poor water movement. 
So as a stress is applied, it makes water move between uh, pores, which uh, allows a, an increased um, strain over time. Long-term creep results in the sliding between our CSH particles or layers. So essentially, we're breaking these van der Waals bond, breaking the van der Waals bonds between the uh, layers, uh, which allows a, a sliding. So long-term creep is primarily unrecoverable. Shown here is a model that we can use to uh, kind of visualize the deformations that occur from a sustained stress. Um, first, we have a spring, and this shows our elastic deformations. So essentially, all of our elastic strain is going to be recoverable. Our long-term creep, um, you know, again, is due to the link breakage between our, our CSH, and we can use a, a viscous damper to um, kind of represent our long-term creep. And uh, our long-term creep is not recoverable because it involves the breaking of bonds. Our short-term creep is kind of like a delayed elasticity. So it'll be a, a combination of kind of a spring and viscous damper response. So our short-term creep will be recoverable, but it's going to be sluggish compared to our elastic strain. The four main types of shrinkage are shown on this slide. Uh, we have thermal shrinkage, autogenous shrinkage, external drying shrinkage, and carbonation shrinkage. Uh, the two main types uh, are autogenous shrinkage and external drying shrinkage. Autogenous shrinkage is uh, where water is going to be lost to hydrate our cement. External drying shrinkage is where water is going to migrate from the concrete to the environment. You can see that shrinkage in general is going to be driven by our pore water pressure. So as water leaves our pores, it's going to create a, a pressure that wants to create this, this shrinkage or volume change in the concrete, and it's going to be resisted by the stiffness of our concrete. Um, so you can see stiffer concretes are going to have uh, less shrinkage. Autogenous shrinkage, as I said, is where our water comes from the pores and is used to hydrate our cement. Our early cement hydration equa equation here, we have our C3S being hydrated with our water um, to produce our CSH, our CH, and, and heat. Later, um, our slower reacting components of our cement, primarily our C2S, still want to react with water to, pr to produce CSH and CH. Um, but the question is, you know, where does this water come from? So the water to hydrate our cement after set is going to come from our pores. Um, depending on how much energy it takes to pull the water from these pores to, to um, hydrate our cement will kind of control how much shrinkage occurs. Um, so anyway, this is the, the basic idea of autogenous shrinkage, though. External drying shrinkage is shrinkage that occurs due to the migration of water from the concrete to the environment. This type of shrinkage is going to depend on how easy it is for water to move through the concrete matrix. A high permeability concrete uh, or a, a concrete with high permeability will have higher shrinkage because more water is able to leave uh, to the environment um, compared to a uh, concrete with low permeability where it's going to be more difficult for water to leave to the environment. Um, also, a section or member with a, a, a low volume to surface area ratio um, will, I guess there's kind of less distance the water needs to travel to get outside uh, to the environment. Um, so this section here would have more shrinkage than the section shown below with a, a higher um, volume to surface area ratio. So the main factors that affect our creep and shrinkage are highlighted in this table below. Uh, you can see some of the main effects from our mixture, our water to cement ratio, and our aggregate properties. Uh, if we have a stiffer aggregate, we're going to have a stiffer concrete, and we're going to have less drying shrinkage and also less creep. Um, you can also see uh, environmental effects, relative humidity will uh, have the largest effect from the environment. And uh, if we're looking at design and construction, um, curing is going to have a large effect on our shrinkage. And the 
load magnitude and duration is going to have the biggest effect uh, for Crete. Strand relaxation is the phenomenon in which the stress in a strand will decrease over time if it's held at a constant strain. Um, so here in this strand, if we held it at a constant strain, um, so we strain it and hold it at a constant strain, um, it's going to the stress required to hold it at that constant strain is going to decrease over time. Um, so this difference in the stress required to hold it at that strain at time zero versus time t is called uh, relaxation. Um, we're generally going to have larger magnitudes of relaxation uh, with larger initial applied stress and also higher temperatures. Um, and then the next kind of point is um, the strand relaxation is going to depend on the strand fabrication process. Um, so low relaxation strands are going to undergo considerably less relaxation than stress relief strands. Shown here are two different expressions for estimating our strand relaxation. Uh, the first here is an uh, expression from Megura et al. And you can see that an increased initial stress um, will lead to increased strain relaxation. Um, and you can also see uh, the time factor here to account for how relaxation occurs over time. Uh, in ASHTO LRFD, you can see an additional term here that takes into account um, a decreased stress uh, in the strand over time um, that result, or that's a result of our shrinkage and uh, creep losses. Now we're going to look at how we can actually estimate our pre-stress losses. Um, there are several different categories um, to uh, procedures to estimate our pre-stress losses. Uh, the first is we have some simplified procedures um, or lump sum methods. And in these methods, we're essentially either grouping all of our losses into our different, you know, major components. So um, calculating, you know, one total elastic shortening, one shrinkage, one creep, and one relaxation loss. Um, or in some cases, just having one um, kind of lump sum loss, like 30 KSI as your total losses. Um, so anyway, this is one category. Uh, the other one is uh, time dependent. So uh, with our time dependent, we have, it's generally the same components as our simplified uh, or lump sum methods, but we include time in the estimation of losses. Um, so we're gonna look at one kind of simplified procedure, and uh, then we're gonna look at one time dependent procedure and one kind of general time dependent procedure uh, called the time step approach. On the next couple slides, I, I'll show the equations for calculating pre-stress losses using the PCI design handbook approach. Um, first, you'll need to uh, calculate your elastic shortening losses um, using the equations shown here. Uh, the thing to highlight here is um, PCI assumes that your initial pre-stress force to use in this um, F sub CGP equation is 90% of uh, your pre-stress force set uh, at the time of jacking, um, so before transfer. So rather than iterating, they just assume a 10% a decrease in your initial strand stress. Um, so otherwise, you can uh, you know calculate your um, strand or your stress in the concrete at the center of your strands, F sub CIR as they define it, which is the same thing as F sub CGP as defined in AASHTO, and then um, use this to calculate your elastic shortening losses, and then you can use this to calculate your um, stress in your pre-stressing strands immediately after transfer. Creep losses uh, can be calculated using the equation shown here. Um, you can see that a, a couple things to highlight. The stiffness of the concrete, you use EC here, um, compared to your elastic shortening where you're using um, E sub CI. Uh, so the EC, the stiffness of your concrete using the ultimate strength of the concrete uh, versus ECI, the stiffness of the concrete using the initial um, strength of the concrete. Uh, you can also see we include a stress here, um, which is from all your superimposed sustained loads and uh, your stress from your elastic shortening. And then you take this whole value here times this K sub CR. And K sub CR is essentially a um, creep coefficient. 
Uh, so you can see we're taking our uh, our creep coefficient here. We have um, 2.0 for normal weight concrete and 1.6 for sand lightweight concrete. To find the shrinkage loss, we need to find our shrinkage strain, epsilon sh, uh, and take at times our pre-stressing or the uh, um, stiffness of our pre-stressing strands. Um, so you can see here the shrinkage strain is going to be dependent on our volume to surface area ratio, um, and sorry, volume to surface area ratio and our external relative humidity. And uh, note here that relative humidity, um, if you have 70% as an example, you would plug 70 uh, in here as your RH. So we can calculate our shrinkage strain and then take it times our modulus to find our um, shrinkage loss. Finally, we can find our relaxation loss. Uh, relaxation loss is dependent on several different constants, which we can get from the table shown here. Um, so generally, we'll have uh, grade 270 low relaxation strands. So we'll have uh, KRE as 5,000 and J as 0.04. Um, and typically here, we'll typically have an F sub PI divided by F sub PU of 0.75. Um, so we'll typically have a value of 1.0 for our, our C factor. And uh, you can see here, the more shrinkage creep and elas elastic shortening losses that happen, the lower our uh, relaxation losses. We can add all of our losses together to calculate our total losses. So our elastic shortening loss plus shrinkage plus creep loss plus relaxation loss gives us our uh, total pre-stress loss. And then we can find our pre-stress forces at the initial um, pre-stress or, or initial time, so time of transfer, uh, to be the stress in, in the strands um, before transfer minus our elastic shortening loss. And then uh, our final pre-stress force, so the um, pre-stressing force um, when we're calculating uh, the stresses due to service loads are the stress in, in our strands before transfer minus our total losses. And then, you know, in both cases, we can take that stress times the area to get our force P sub I and P sub F. Um, and we'll use these uh, when we calculate our, our stresses. We're next going to turn and look at how to estimate pre-stress losses using AASHTO. And before we do that, I wanted to give us a, a brief overview of uh, the history of pre-stress losses in, in uh, AC on AASHTO. Um, so back in 1958, you can see our initial um, kind of pre-stress loss equation. And you can see we would calculate uh, an elastic shortening strain, a shrinkage strain, and a creep strain, and take it times our uh, stiffness of our pre-stressing. And uh, that would give us our, our, and add in a relaxation component here, and that would give us our, our total losses. You can see in uh, the AASHTO uh, LRFD um, prior to 2005, um, we had a kind of a similar expression for our total losses. So again, we had a, a term here to calculate our elastic shortening loss, um, our shrinkage loss, our creep loss, and our relaxation uh, losses. There was an NCHRP project in the early 2000s that was uh, brought about because of some perceived inaccuracies in the uh, ASHTO LRFT uh, procedure. Uh, so the first was um, the past uh, procedure for calculating losses was all based on um, testing results and monitoring results of normal strength concrete uh, members. So in the past, that was fine, but in the early 2000s, they were starting to, to utilize high strength and high performance concretes more. So they wanted to make sure that the uh, loss procedures were, were updated to reflect current practice. There was also a disconnect between the pre-stress loss section and the uh, material section. So pre-stress losses are dependent on the material behavior. So there was a, a question as to, you know, why aren't the uh, shrinkage strain and creep coefficient calculated in the uh, material section of AASHTO used when calculating pre-stress losses? Um, so this was another kind of perceived inaccuracy. Um, the last one was that the Astro LRFD was based on kind of a simplified theory and simple and simple equations. Um, so the simple equations were perceived as uh, inaccurate for uh, estimating 
losses in you know other types of members and, and more complex members than just uh, simply supported beams. So the uh, NCHRP project uh, attempted to kind of update the code for current practice um, by doing creep and shrinkage studies on high performance concrete uh, cylinders and members. And they also instrument, instrumented a number of high performance concrete bridge girders. In their uh, proposed uh, equations, um, they now connected the pre-stress loss expressions with the material section properties, um, which kind of address this second issue. Um, so you can see now, uh, as an example, when calculating the um, shrinkage loss, you need to calculate the shrinkage strain using the material properties section. Um, so you know you're working between sections here. And uh, finally, this, the simplified theory, um, they added in some additional uh, coefficients like this KID, which uh, takes into account um, how pre-stress losses and time-dependent behavior is restrained by um, you know internal steel and uh, you know some things like that. The work done by this uh, NCHRP project led to the procedure, which was adopted by ASHTO LRFD in the uh, 2005 uh, interim edition. The major components of our pre-stress losses uh, using ASHTO LRFD um, after the 2005 interim edition are, are shown on this slide. Um, so you can see the first distinction is made between our short-term and long-term losses. Um, so we have our elastic shortening loss and our long-term losses. And our long-term losses are further subdivided into losses that occur before deck placement, so initial to deck, and losses that happen between the time of deck placement and final time. And you can see a number of uh, the other components here. So we'll have our, our shrinkage, creep, and relaxation losses before and after deck placement. And then also we have this additional component that takes into account um, kind of gains that happen because of the differential behavior between the deck concretes and the uh, girder concrete. Uh, the last uh, variable definitions uh, for these equations are shown on this slide. The elastic shortening loss can be calculated using the equation shown here. And it's dependent on this F sub G P term, uh, which is defined as the concrete stress at the center of gravity of the pre-stressing tendons due to the pre-stressing force immediately after transfer um, and the self weight of the member at the section of maximum moment. Um, so to find this pre-stress force immediately after transfer, you need to calculate the elastic shortening loss. Um, so this is in essence a, an iterative procedure. Um, so you need to, you can assume an initial strand stress of 90%, and then you need to continue to iterate until you have uh, an acceptable level of accuracy. So shown here again is the iterative process to um, calculate our elastic shortening loss. Um, so first you would assume an initial pre-stress, uh, pre-stressing stress, and then use that to calculate the stress in the concrete at the centroid of the strands, and then use that to calculate your losses and the strand stress after those losses. Um, if your strand stress after your losses is equal to the strand stress that you assumed at the beginning, then you can stop iterating. So here, you know, iterate once, iterate twice, iterate three times, and you keep iterating until the strand stress that you assume is equal to the strand stress that you calculate. Again, as I mentioned earlier, ASHTO provides an equation in the commentary for calculating the elastic shortening loss directly. And um, again, as mentioned earlier, this equation can be derived by um, taking your F sub CGP found by uh, or with a strand stress equal to your strand stress before transfer minus your elastic shortening and plugging this into your elastic shortening equation and then solving for your elastic shortening. And doing this, you would get um, your uh, or this direct equation found in the uh, commentary of Ashto. The estimation of creep and shrinkage loss requires first finding the creep coefficients uh, 
and uh, shrinkage strains um, from the material properties section. Um, so shown here is the equation to calculate the shrinkage strain, um, which includes different factors taking into account the humidity of the external environment, the shape factor, which takes into account the volume to surface area ratio of, of your component, and a uh, concrete strength factor, taking into account the strength of the concrete, um, typically the initial strength of the concrete, and also this time development factor, which uh, allows your shrinkage or helps you to tell how your shrinkage is going to develop uh, over time. Our creep coefficient expression has some similar factors to shrinkage strain. Um, the only real different one is the humidity factor for creep is, is slightly different than the one for um, shrinkage. The um, required factors that were mentioned on the last two slides are shown here. Um, so again, we have a, a factor for humidity, a different one for shrinkage versus creep, uh, a factor taking into account the shape of the section, so uh, using the volume to surface area ratio, a factor taking into account the concrete release strength, and a, a time development factor, a K sub TD, um, which takes into account how creep and shrinkage develop over time. The presence of steel in a member is going to resist both shrinkage and creep of the concrete. So if you have a, a girder in A without pre-stressing steel, it's going to undergo unrestrained shrinkage as shown in B. Um, so you can see here, our concrete itself is going to want to shrink to a certain point. The presence of the steel is going to restrain shrinkage at the location of that steel. Um, so you can see here we're going to have less shrinkage um, at the location of the steel and um, overall we're going to have a, a decreased amount of shrinkage in the section. Uh, so this behavior is, is accounted for in AASHTO using these uh, section uh, coefficients. So K sub ID and K sub DF, um, which we're going to look at on the next slide. Shown here is a sample derivation of uh, our shrinkage expression. So essentially starting from compatibility, we can uh, look at our strains from our above figure, um, substitute in our strain values for our, our pre-stressing, our um, shrinkage and our uh, strain from the change in our pre-stressing force and then kind of simplify things to get um, this in terms of the change in the pre-stressing force divided by the area, um, which is equal to our shrinkage loss, um, is going to be equal to the shrinkage strain times this K sub ID times the stiffness of our pre-stressing. Um, so this K sub ID shown here uh, is, again, the uh, it, takes into account the restraint provided um, by the steel in our section, the, the pre-stressing steel. Um, yeah, that restrains our, our, the shrinkage. Shown on this slide are the other uh, definitions for the variables um, for our K sub ID uh, term. Um, so you can see the definitions for, for these uh, different terms. Um, you can do a similar derivation for creep and you'll get the same KID term. Um, so we're gonna use this case of ID for both shrinkage loss and uh, creep loss. We're going to have a lot of different subscripts on our variables to describe what element we're talking about and also what time period we're talking about. Um, so in general, if we have a B or a D, we're talking about either the beam element or the deck. And in terms of time, um, our I typically stands for initial time. Um, so the initial time of loading or exposure to the environment. Our D typically stands for the time of deck placement and F for final time or the uh, entire design life. So for, as an example, epsilon sub B I D is the shrinkage strain in the beam from the initial time to the time of deck placement. Um, so we'll have some si similar subscripts and other variables, but uh, this is kind of the general rule. The first long-term loss term that we need to calculate is our um, shrinkage loss from the initial time to the time of deck placement. 
Um, so we can use the equation shown here. We need to calculate the shrinkage strain, and we need to calculate our transform section coefficient um, from initial to deck, and take uh, our shrinkage strain in the beam from initial to deck times our transform section coefficient from initial to deck times the modulus of our pre-stressing, and that'll give us our uh, shrinkage loss from the initial time to the time of uh, deck placement. Here are the other variable definitions that we'll need. Um, you can note that we're going to use our modulus of elasticity of our concrete at transfer, E sub CI, and our section properties, we're going to use our gross section properties, so AG, IG, and uh, our strand eccentricity um, with our gross section. The next loss component that we'll need is our creep loss from time of release to time of deck placement. Um, so our creep loss we can calculate by uh, taking our concrete stress at the centroid of gravity of our pre-stressing tendons, our F sub CGP, times this KID, the uh, transform section coefficient, times our creep coefficient from initial to deck placement, times the stiffness of our strands and divided by the modulus of elasticity um, of our concrete at time of release, uh, E sub CI. We can next find our shrinkage loss from time of deck placement to our final time. Our shrinkage loss, it, we need to find the shrinkage strain in the beam from deck or from the time of deck placement to our final time. Take that times the stiffness of our pre-stressing, E sub P, and then times our transform section coefficient from time of deck placement to our final time, or K sub DF. Um, note uh, some differences here. Uh, we're using our composite section property now um, rather than our uh, gross section properties. Here are some uh, other variable definitions that we'll need to calculate our uh, shrinkage loss. The next loss that we can calculate is our creep loss from the time of deck placement to final time. The, this creep loss is made up of two main components. The creep loss from the initial applied stresses, um, so this is our initial pre-stressing and our self-weight, um, and we're kind of changing this so that we're going from the um, time of deck placement to final time. And then the second component takes into account the change in the concrete stress at the centroid of the pre-stressings or the pre-stressing strands due to our long-term losses between transfer and, and deck placement combined with our deck weight and superimposed dead loads. So it, we're going to have two main components. Uh, we're going to have a, a, the stress, stress change due to our superimposed dead loads and deck weight, and then also the stress change due to our pre-stress losses. So our pre-stress losses occur it's going to decrease the stress in our pre-stressing, so it's going to decrease the stress that drives our creep. Um, so this is how we're going to uh, take that into account. So um, this second expression isn't given in the code, but it's, it's implied um, within this definition. So you can see here uh, some other definitions that we'll need um, to calculate our creep loss, um, mainly this piece of delta or the total long-term pre-stress losses prior to deck placement. Um, so again, this, this equation isn't given in the code, but it's, it's implied, um, in, implied in the code. The next component that we'll look at is related to the effect of deck shrinkage relative to the beam shrinkage. Uh, essentially at the time of deck placement, the majority of the beam shrinkage will have already occurred. Um, so when you take your beam um, out to the construction site, uh, at that point, most of the shrinkage in the beam will have already happened. So when you cast your slab or your deck on top, your deck's going to want to shrink, but your beam is going to be resisting that shrinkage from happening. Um, so essentially the deck is going to kind of place a load on the top of your section um, that'll cause kind of stress across this depth of your section that'll increase the stress in the strand and also increase the, the concrete stress, um, uh, concrete tensile stress on the bottom fiber. Uh, 
Um, so note that this may not be the actual behavior of the deck. Uh, if you have precast deck panels um, like they use in many states, uh, one of them being Texas, the precast deck panel is going to actually be the element that's going to resist the shrinkage. Um, so you won't have as much, uh, or you won't see a, as large an effect um, in the actual beam um, from the shrinkage of the deck. Ashto estimates the impact of the effect of the relative shrinkage uh, differential between the deck and the beam using the equation shown here. Um, so we have our loss component, which will actually end up being a, a gain or an increase in, in our uh, pre-stressing stress. Um, that's dependent on this change in concrete stress at the central to the pre-stressing strands due to our deck shrinkage. Um, our case of DF, our, uh, tr trans or our, yeah, our transform section coefficient, and our creep coefficient for our beam. This change in stress is determined by essentially applying our deck shrinkage as a, an eccentric uh, a load with some eccentricity. Um, so that we can calculate the load that's caused or the force that's caused um, by our deck shrinkage and apply it at the, cent the center of the deck. And then we can calculate the, uh, the effect of that force applied at that eccentricity on our section. Um, and that's essentially what this uh, stress component is. Uh, the final component that we'll talk about is our strand relaxation loss. Um, so Ashto splits the strand relaxation loss into losses that happen before and after deck placement and allows you to calculate the losses before deck placement using this equation shown here. And it tells you that your deck placement loss, or sorry, your um, relaxation loss after deck placement is going to be equal to your loss before deck placement. Um, so essentially you need to calculate your loss once and then um, this will be before deck placement and then uh, you'll have the same amount of loss, relaxation loss that happens after deck placement. There's also a more complex expression that's found in the commentary uh, that allows you to come up with a time dependent value for your relaxation loss uh, shown here. Um, so you can see it's similar to the Magura et al. expression that we looked at earlier, um, except we have an additional term that is essentially a, a reduction factor um, that accounts for losses that occur in the member. Um, and also we have our, the transform section coefficient. Uh, shown here is the additional uh, definition for our, our transform section coefficient um, that we use uh, for this relaxation loss. The simplified equation uh, can be determined by um, using this complex equation uh, and plugging in 0.67 for our reduction term, using a KID of 0.8, um, using an initial time of 0.75 days and a uh, time of deck placement of 120 days. Um, so if you plug in these values, you'll get the um, relaxation equation that's found in the, in the body. Uh, of Ashto. So using these different uh, combination of losses, we can then find the initial pre-stress force. We can find the force in the pre-stressing at the time of deck placement. And then we can also find the uh, force in our pre-stressing um, when we're calculating our stresses due to our, our service loads. Uh, so our final pre-stress. The last procedure that we're going to look at is the time step approach. Um, so this approach you only need to do for more complex structures. Uh, it requires you know, more effort and also more uh, detailed inputs. Um, so again, you only need it for more complex structures. The first step in the time step approach is to gather your required input properties. Um, you'll need the same section of material properties that you'll need for other pre-stress loss procedures. Um, so you can gather these as, as your inputs. Next, you'll need to choose a procedure for estimating your time effects in both your concrete and pre-stressing. Um, you can use any procedure you want, uh, but you'll need to estimate your shrinkage, uh, your creep, and your uh, strand relaxation. You can next calculate your variables that are independent of time. 
Um, so based on the procedure you choose, if you're using Ashto, these factors would be your, you know, your shape factor, your relative humidity factors, uh, and your concrete strength factors. Next, you'll need to determine an expression for your concrete strength and modulus development over time. Um, so the time step approach, you're going to uh, estimate at different times the concrete strength and the concrete stiffness and use those to calculate your um, losses and, and um, you know, also your creep and shrinkage. Uh, so you need some expression to uh, estimate how your concrete strength develops over time. Um, so shown here is just a, a common expression where um, A and B in this expression are, are constants that can be um, calibrated based on your specific concrete. Um, if you have type 1 cement that's moist cured, your A is going to be about 4 and your B is going to be about 0.85. Um, so that can be a good starting point for you. If you don't have more detailed information, then uh, you can just use an equation for modulus um, based on the concrete compressive strength. Uh, so shown here are two equations from Ashto, um, you know, one from the body, one from the commentary, where you can calculate the stiffness at any yeah, at any time based on the, the strength um, that you would have calculated on the previous uh, slide. Then for the first step, you'll need to calculate your F prime C and your EC for whatever time you're interested in. You'll need to then next calculate your time development factor. So I'm showing you here the uh, Ashto LRFD time development factor. Next, you'll need to calculate your creep coefficient and your shrinkage strain for that time. And uh, then you'll need to calculate your total creep. Um, so if you're using Ashto LRFD, you'll need to calculate the strand stress um, due to your elastic shortening, calculate the FCGP, so the uh, stress in your concrete at the centroid of your pre-stressing strand from your pre-stressing and your self-weight. And then you can calculate your creep strain based on your concrete stiffness and the uh, stress in your concrete at the center of your pre-stressing strands, um, as shown here. You can then use your creep and shrinkage strains to calculate your creep and shrinkage losses just by taking your strains times your modulus. Um, so, you know, using those two expressions. And then finally, you can calculate the uh, relaxation loss using um, any method uh, that you want. Um, so then here you have your relaxation loss, your creep loss, and your shrinkage loss um, between the initial time and whatever time of interest uh, you're looking at. Next, you can add these three components together to get your long-term loss at time t. And you can use this long-term loss to calculate your elastic rebound. Um, so the uh, amount uh, that your section kind of rebounds back due to this pre-stress loss. Then you can uh, add these together to get your total loss for that step. Um, so your total loss minus your rebound uh, gives you the um, the total loss um, during this step. And then you can determine the strand stress and concrete stress at the end of this step uh, just by taking uh, your, so your, str your strand stress is going to be the initial stress um, before transfer minus your elastic shortening loss minus the total loss that happens uh, at between time t naught and that time step you're looking at. And then you can use this stress uh, in the pre-stressing to calculate the um, stress in the concrete. For each of your subsequent time steps until the casting of your deck, you can use the stress in your strand and the stress at the centroid of your, uh, in your concrete at the centroid of your pre-stressing strands from the previous time step um, at the beginning of the next time step. Um, so otherwise the steps are the same, so you can loop through uh, all of the steps that I described on the last couple slides until the time of deck placement. After deck placement, uh, we're gonna add in some additional components. Um, so the first thing we need to do is calculate all of our material properties and the coefficients for our deck concrete. Then we need to 
add our elastic gain due to deck placement, um, but we only need to do this once to the uh, first step um, when we include our deck. So uh, we include this gain um, that's, you know, so an elastic gain that's uh, caused by the deck placement and any other superimposed dead loads. Next, we need to calculate the creep and shrinkage strains for our deck. Um, so we can calculate those as shown here. And uh, then we need to calculate the force the deck shrinkage places on the beam. Um, so we can calculate that uh, using the equation shown here. And uh, again, this is similar to Ashto where um, our shrinkage is going to kind of apply a force that's going to increase the stress in our pre-stressing and also the stress in uh, the bottom fiber of our beam. Next, we can calculate all of our losses after deck placement. Uh, all of the loss components that we had before deck placement are going to continue. Um, so they'll stay the same, um, but we'll have two additional components. Uh, so we'll have this first component, which is the uh, additional um, creep component um, from our uh, the deck placement. And then we'll also have the uh, differential shrinkage component um, as, as shown here. So th these two will be additional components and all the other loss uh, components are going to just continue. Our last steps are going to be similar to the steps uh, before deck placement. Um, so we'll calculate the total long-term loss at any time t. Um, so we have all of our components, our shrinkage, creep, relaxation, and then the additional two components that I showed on the last slide. Then we can calculate our elastic rebound recovery and calculate our total loss for the step. And then finally, we can calculate the strand stress and the concrete stress at the end of each step, which we would use for, um, for our next step. Using the time step approach allows you to estimate the pre-stress losses uh, over time and allows you to come up with a, a loss versus time plot as shown here. Um, and you can see it, uh, the time step approach does a pretty nice job of uh, estimating the actual losses in, in a section. Um, so here for some uh, beams that I uh, monitored in some previous research, you can see the loss estimate in the dotted line and the measured losses in the solid line. I um, mean, you can see in both cases, it does a, a pretty good job. Um, note that in this project, we had beams stored at a couple different locations. Um, so we had beams stored in, in a drier location, Lubbock, uh, and then also in some more um, humid locations uh, closer to Houston and um, also in uh, the Austin, San Antonio, um, you know, kind of Dallas uh, I-35 corridor there. There are two primary ways that we can um, measure our pre-stress losses. Uh, the first one is long-term monitoring using some type of internal or external um, strain gauge. Uh, the one shown here is a vibrating wire gauge, um, but fiber optic gauges or, or something similar could also be used. Uh, the other method is through service load testing um, used to measure the load required to cause first cracking. Um, once we determine the load required to cause first cracking, uh, we can kind of use that to calculate the effective stress in the strand at time of testing. Monitoring using vibrating wire strain gauges allows for distinguishing between elastic shortening and long-term losses, and also allows for observing how losses develop over time. Uh, so you can see here, we had 29 KSI of elastic shortening loss, and we can see the losses that occur before the beams are transferred to storage. Um, and then we can see the additional losses that developed when these beams were in Lubbock or when they were in Austin. Um, so vibrating wire gauges allow for all, all that, um, yeah, all those differenti differentiations. Um, determining pre-stress loss from service load testing requires a four point load test setup to apply a load until cracking occurs in the beam. So the cracking load can then be used to calculate the stress in the pre-stressing strand at the time of testing. Uh, so this is a destructive test and it requires a beam be removed from the structure for testing um, to a lab. So uh, this type of test 
can be used for beams that are being decommissioned from uh, bridges um, if you know if your bridge demolition is done with care uh, so anyway those are the the two main types of ways to measure losses and uh, we'll talk about each in the next couple slides in more detail One way to monitor losses is uh, through long-term monitoring using internal instrumentation. Um, the instrumentation shown here is a vibrating wire gauge, um, which is a, a little strain gauge that uh, measures the um, change in displacement between the two end pieces. Um, and from that, you can back out the strain change. Uh, you can install these at different heights in the cross section, um, which allows you to measure the strain profile across the cross section and uh, monitor the strain change uh, at the central of your pre-stressing strands. These gauges can either be uh, measured using little hand readers, uh, the one shown here, um, or you can set up a, a data acquisition system to um, you know, continuously monitor, monitor these over time. As I mentioned, uh, you can put these vibrating wire gauges at multiple sections across the uh, cross-section depth um, and you can measure the strain at each of these locations which will give you a typically a linear strain profile and then you can use this to calculate the strain uh, at the central order of the pre-stressing strands um, so once you have the strain you can take a time to your modulus to uh, find the uh, change in stress um, in your pre-stressing strands Shown here are some results uh, from some previous testing that I did uh, where we used vibrating wire gauges to measure the pre-stress losses and uh, how they developed over time. Um, so you can see here the initial elastic shortening loss in both beams was about 29 KSI and then uh, the beams were kept in storage at the precast plant and then transferred uh, to Lubbock and Austin for uh, further monitoring. Um, so you can see in, in Lubbock the drier climate led to more um, creep and shrinkage losses uh, than the uh, slightly more humid climate uh, in Austin. The other method for measuring or determining your pre-stress losses is through service load testing. Um, so service load testing, what we do is uh, we essentially apply uh, point loads uh, to a beam. So typically we'll apply two point loads um, so that we get a constant moment region where first cracking will occur. And uh, we apply the load until we get uh, first cracking through uh, experimental testing. Um, so typically if you're going to measure losses, you're, you'll do it through um, internal instrumentation. Um, but if you have some girders that are being taken from a you know, a bridge that was in service and you want to determine the stress in the pre-stressing strands um, or, you know, the current stress in the pre-stressing strands, you can bring those girders to a lab and you can do this testing to determine the stress. In order to determine the um, stress in the pre-stressing at time of testing, you need to be able to determine the first cracking load somehow. Um, so it's very difficult to determine the first cracking load through visual inspection. Um, so you need to do it using uh, some of the data that you would gather um, through testing. And uh, one method for um, determining the first cracking load is by looking at the, um, or looking for a drop in stiffness in the load deflection plot, um, which I'm gonna show you how to do on the next couple slides. So shown here is a sample um, force versus displacement plot for one of the beams tested uh, in this experimental program. Um, so you can see we can discretize this plot and we can calculate the stiffness um, for each small discretization. So shown here is the stiffness um, for each of these small discretizations uh, plotted versus displacement. We can plot a moving average uh, of this stiffness and we can look for the point when our stiffness starts to drop away from this moving average. And we're going to assume that this point here 
is when first cracking occurs. We can take the uh, displacement from that point back to our force displacement plot, and we can find uh, the load that's associated with that displacement. And this load is then, uh, or we can assume that that load is then our, our first cracking load. We can then use the uh, first cracking load along with the self weight and any other superimposed dead loads um, and use a measured tensile strength of our concrete, um, you know, using the modulus of rupture or modified split cylinder. Uh, and then we can rearrange things and calculate uh, the effective stress in our pre stressing strand at the time of testing. Um, so once we have that, we can take um, the jacking stress minus this F sub PE, and that gives us our total pre-stress losses. Uh, as part of this research, we set up a comprehensive database with uh, over 140 different beams um, that essentially represent the diversity of members that are found in bridge design. You can see how the different or the three different loss methods that we looked at in this presentation um, perform compared to this database. So the PCI design method, the Ashdol RFD detailed method, and the time step method. Uh, essentially, in this plot, we have um, the estimated final loss plotted against the measured final loss. Um, each one of these points represents one beam from the database, and this line running down the middle. Uh, would represent where a beam or where the measured final loss was estimated perfectly. Um, so you can see points falling above this line are conservative um, and points falling below this line are, are unconservative or underestimated. Um, so you can see the PCI method, most of these points fall above the line. So in most cases, um, the loss was overestimated. With Ashto, you can see this line um, kind of, or there are a lot more points that fall below the line, um, but there's still a pretty wide scatter. And uh, the time step method, we have a, a kind of a closer um, scatter, so a little less scatter and more points kind of falling around this um, 1.0 line. Um, so we'll look at some statistics on the, uh, the next slide. So uh, you can see here some statistics. We have the uh, minimum um, experimental to measure or uh, uh, estimated to measured ratio, uh, the average maximum estimated to measured, uh, the coefficient of variation, standard deviation, and then the um, kind of range that uh, some of these uh, um, estimates fell in. So uh, was it less than 0.6 between 0.6 and 0.8 or 0.8 to 1.0? So the number of uh, different specimens that were um, underestimated uh, by different amounts. So you can see in general, the PCI method was uh, in general overestimated the measured um, value uh, compared to the Ashto simplified, Ashto refined, and the time step, which uh, were, you know, were kind of closer to um, estimating the actual uh, pre-stress losses. Um, you can see that our, our uh, time step had the lowest coefficient of variation, followed by PCI simplified and then Ashto refined. Um, and you can see that in general, uh, the right the PCI uh, handbook method only had a, a couple of specimens that were um, had losses that were underestimated, while um, the other methods had a, had a handful of um, specimens that you know had underestimated losses. In the first example here, uh, we have an eye girder uh, with a deck in a simply supported um, bridge. And we're going to use the PCI handbook approach and the Ashto LRFD uh, detailed approach to estimate losses. In our next example, we're going to find the pre-stress loss for this Florida I-beam section um, with a, a six foot uh, beam spacing. Uh, exa for example three, we're going to find the pre-stress loss um, using the Ashto LRFD detailed approach uh, for this box beam section. 
And that concludes our presentation on pre-stress losses.